foundation uh, on CPython, but today we're going to be talking about a project that is not really related uh, to my particular piece of work, but I am a user of it and I am a big fan of it. So um, the reason we need it is that Python is kind of slow uh, and we're going to be talking about this for a while. We're going to be talking about like how uh, this is typically solved currently in um, you know systems that you already are using, especially like you know if you're into data science and whatnot. Um, we're going to be talking about like whether maybe type annotations can also help us to make our code run faster. And you know, spoiler alert: yes, they can because MyPyC is the project that uh, I'm going to be advertising today. Uh, finally, we're going to be having some conversation about like, you know, JITs and other methods to make Python faster. But let's, let's start at the very beginning by just saying, well, yeah, Python is kind of slow. Um, what that means is um, the actual computational power of Python um, like is well, full, it's a programming language that is Turing complete, you can do whatever with it, but due to a bunch of features and design elements of it, uh, that computational uh, power is hindered uh, speed-wise, right? So um, often we're gonna see the same code looking the same in, say, Swift, which is very much similar, like in terms of being high level to Python, or something more low level like C++, code looks kind of the same and is going to be running 10 to 100 times faster on C++ versus Python. Like, and why is that? Well, um, we're going to be talking about this for a while, but what I wanted to first uh, get out of the way is that we are not g we're not going to be talking about like the global interpreter lock and we're not going to be talking about like using many cores at the same time and all sorts of manners that um, adhere to concurrency. So concurrency dealing with many uh, things at once. What we are interested in today is um, parallelism. No, it's single threaded you know, hardcore performance of just running actions one after uh, the other. Uh, this is what we mean. So this is something that is very popular when you're doing any sort of signal processing, right? And this kind of signal processing can be really just numbers where you have, you know, either audio or video, or maybe there's just some information that you're getting uh, in real time, or you have to process batch-wise. Um, like for example, like rendering video is like a big example of this where you're doing color grading, uh, you're you know applying effects and whatnot. Some of this is accelerated by graphics cards right now, like not all of it, so there's some, uh, still many CPU bound tasks there. Uh, Python is not very well suited to be implementing those sorts of workloads. Um, I'm particularly interested in like, you know, uh, synthesis, like um, audio synthesis. Since uh, I'm a hobbyist musician, like this is a Yamaha DX7, like super popular in the 80s. Uh, like even if you don't know it by looks, you know it by sound for sure. Uh, so I actually went ahead and implemented uh, the synthesis engine of it, like in Python. And you know, by doing that, I discovered that, well, this is not really something that Python excels at. It is possible with, you know, the CPUs of today now. Uh, I was able to, like, achieve uh, five voices of polyphony in a very, very basic algorithm compared to 16 voices on this thing, which is uh, which was released in 83. Um, but yeah, like it, it was a little bit disappointing because five voices of polyphony is limiting even if you're just a musician and you just want to play play music on this. So so yeah, like Python is kind of slow, uh, but why? Well, there's uh, many reasons for it and I could just give you my opinions on this, but let's ask like the NumPy people. The NumPy people know their stuff, uh, like the workloads that are um, 
well, like suited for NumPy are exactly the workloads I just said that, you know, Python is maybe not really well uh, suited for. So what are they saying? Like in their docs, they're saying that, well, while Python is a great language, you know, uh, some code is up to 100 times slower than the equivalent code written in a statically compiled language. And they say this is because of the dynamic nature of the language. So what, what do we mean by the dynamic uh, nature of Python. Well, uh, for example, if you are calling the today method on the date class of the date time module, what is in fact happening is a lot of interaction and a lot of it. Like we're s uh, we're trying to find daytime in your locals, then your globals. Uh, when you are finding a name that is daytime, we're going to attribute date on it, which is a dictionary lookup. And then we're going to do another get attribute on uh, the object that we got, which happens to be a class, but still, you know, it's another hash lookup. And after we get all this, there is a method we actually call dunder call on, on this. Uh, so several levels of interaction, and I didn't even go into all details that actually happened there, like only the high level that you can see from Python and all of those you have real time, uh, runtime um, influence over. You can change any of those elements behavior such that actually it'll do something else. And you would say, well, you know, kind of, that's cute that it's so dynamic, but like, who gives a damn? Like, why do you need all this dynamicism? Well, you use it every day. Uh, you use it when you're using uh, some interactive prompt and you're seeing, you know, kind of um, things autocomplete for you, where it'll find things that are available on a given class. Like, this is why, because we can literally read what's on the object. There's a dictionary there. We can just enumerate on its keys. Um, if you are writing data classes, so like this, those data, um, you're looking at debugging, like a lot of the power to see what's going on in Python when things go wrong comes from the fact that it's very dynamic. We can look into what is happening uh, and influence it. We can ask for, you know, locals. We can change code as we are in PDB or Visual Studios, like more interactive or PyCharm's debuggers. Um, so all of those features are actually very useful. We don't really want to give them up. Like we want this sort of dynamicism there because this is why we are using Python in the first place. Otherwise, we could just be using the statically compiled languages and use the static tools for all of those things. Where many languages now provide uh, similar tools, not exactly the same, but you know, similar. With Python, thanks to the REPL, uh, the behavior of your uh, runtime is exactly the same as the things that you're doing in a debugger and whatnot, which is wonderful. That makes it much easier to uh, develop software very quickly. So, um, like the dynamic features of Python, like there, there, there are very many of them. Like you have like the pluggable module import system where you can literally change how uh, Python modules are found and where they're found. Like some implementers actually store their modules in SQLite databases that they zip and send over uh, the network. Uh, I uh, worked at a bank like at some point in my life and uh, we had an import uh, hook that allowed us to uh, load um, encrypted modules. So in Python, usually you know the source, like you see the source, like in a bunch of places, like this was very unadvisable. So, you know, like we could ship code that was um, shipped in an encrypted manner. So like, well, unless you really knew the uh, private keys, you couldn't, um, you couldn't access the, the, the source code. So that's just the module system. And then you have like class descriptors where you can change behavior of how attributes work and whatnot. And you have meta classes and you have decorators and whatnot and whatnot. Like I could go on. Like Python is super dynamic. Um, but fortunately, even though we want this dynamicism and even though we pay the price for it, things are getting better. And in Python 3.11, a group of people at Microsoft, where um, Guido is working uh, now as well, is working on making Python faster. And not by changing Python to make it faster, uh, in terms of 
changing the programming language that we see, but changing the runtime without actually making uh, you change code at all, right? So you can still write code as you were writing it before. You can still use the best practices that are already documented in books and tutorials and whatever, uh, and it just happens to work faster. And what they already report is that Python 3.11 is on average 25% faster than 3.10, which, you know, kind of Python 3.10 was already a, a few percent faster than uh, 3.9 and so on and so on. So si since 3.6, like we have like a constant increase of performance and like this time it also includes uh, startup performance. Um, so things are getting better, but pretty slowly. Uh, and we sometimes need not like 25%, but those 10 or 100 uh, times increases in performance for things to be viable. So what do we do then? Well, um, going back to NumPy and this documentation, this page, uh, what it tells us is like, oh, like therefore one of the most common needs is to call out from Python code to a fast machine uh, code routine, right? So you just need to write in a different language and then just call the, this fast code from uh, Python. And there are many ways to do this. If you are already familiar with another programming languages, things are kind of easy for you. It's not perfect because you need to know this other programming language, but if you do, you can just write a C extension if the language you know is C. Um, C Python is written in C, so you know it's, it's helpful to know this. Um, by writing C extensions manually, is a pretty tricky deal. Like you can do this, many people are doing this. Um, there are plenty of those in Python itself. Uh, but then you're, you have the full C API to take care of. So you need to think about GIL interactions, you need to think about reference counting. And this is something that is in particular tricky where um, it's very easy to uh, cause reference leaks, meaning uh, you increase the reference counts more than you decrease them after you don't no longer need an object. And this is a problem. Like we have uh, specific build bots in CPython where we test for this particular problem because even as CPython core developers where we deal with this day in, day out, like we constantly make mistakes that m mean that in some edge case we uh, increase references more than we decrease them. So not the most recommended way to do things right now. Uh, like you can write a C extension manually, but maybe you should use something else instead. And what that is, is for example, just drop the you know um, module layer of Python, just write the C function that you need, and then uh, use it from C types. So what C types does is like this magic API where Mm. it will look at the symbols of an SO file and, you know, allow you to just call functions that are found there. Uh, it also allows you to um, allocate memory for structs and pointers and all sorts of weird things in, um, in C. So you can literally crash the interpreter very easily, like with a one-liner from C types, because you are now accessing the lowest level of uh, the runtime. You are now at the level of C. Um, this is not a bad way to program, but the API is kind of cumbersome, and it's not so fast, in fact, when you are doing a lot of repeated calls to those C functions. Um, so there is another newer way to do the same, which is called CFFI, which um, uses the actual C header files, where you just put them into CFFI, and it will generate um, you know, an API on the Python level for you, which is then faster to recall uh, and also kind of more um, friendly towards, say, um, PyPy and Iron Python and other alternative Python implementations because C types really kind of uh, relies on the fact that you will be uh, running a runtime that is written in C. Uh, so it's, it is mm, supported to an extent in PyPy, but it's pretty slow. CFFI can be very fast in PyPy. Uh, but it's still the same thing, where it's for people who know C. You need to now have a C compiler to like compile your code, to uh, make those things that run fast be fast. 
but now you cannot really use Python objects, right? Like so, like all you're gonna be doing is is going to be something I don't know, string processing or maybe some database uh, interaction or like number crunching. But there's no Python object, so not perfect. Um, so if you go one level higher, like there's C++, like a much bigger language than C, and with PyBind 11, you can now write Python modules that uh, are more like well, there's a DSL that PyBind 11 really gives you, uh, domain-specific language, that you know essentially uh, allows you to kind of write cutesy Python modules, um, like P Python extensions, that for me personally don't look like C++ and don't look like Python, they don't, don't look like anything. They look like PyBind 11. Like, if you know how they work, awesome. Like, there, there's a bunch of like weird things that it supports. For example, like you just create an object in a, in a scope uh, in C++ that, you know, uh, allows you, for example, to just uh, increase and decrease a reference when that scope is entered and left. And you don't have to actually do any code. Like, you just have to create this object and it'll automatically do this um, memory allocation, the allocation. So that's cool, but it's it's pretty magical. Like so, it's pretty strange to me. Uh, but it is uh, seeing pretty heavy usage in some machine learning um, frameworks. So PyBind 11 is here if you need uh, to interact with C++. You can also interact with Rust, which, for example, cryptography is now using. There was a very good talk about like how this was. Um, you know, implemented and why the change to Rust was done in cryptography at PyCon US. This is already online uh, on YouTube, so I highly recommend you uh, use it. Like, you know, long story short, like Rust is a memory safe language, so unlike all the other others above, it's much harder to create a security vulnerability just because you don't do bounce checks or, you know, declare uh, less memory than you actually need it, um, and so on and so on. So Rust, good step forward, but another case where you need to know another language. So that brings me to the kind of weirdest two. Uh, first of all, like, I just needed to add it because it's fun. Like, you can write Python modules in Fortran too. Uh, like, that's actually what NumPy uh, has in their docs, and there are a bunch uh, on, in NumPy as well. Like, it's... Uh, it, it, it's funny if you're not a data scientist, but like, you know, for, for data science, there's plenty of code that, you know, spans uh, 30, 40 years um, and it's still usable. So yes, like Fortran's still a viable thing uh, for Python extensions. Uh, but the weirdest of the bunch is Cython, uh, heavily used by NumPy, uh, heavily used by HDB. We're going to be talking about this in a second. Um, like where it's also a DSL because you can write Cython that looks exactly like Python and it claims to be a very, very... Um, well, compatible, um, well, kind of syntax-wise with regular Python, but you can now sprinkle bits of C and C++ in that Python X file, and it'll do magic things to, so that it produces a Python uh, extension that is now faster. Um, like, it felt strange to me to just talk about Cython with some, like, uh, example that is made up. So instead, like, let's talk about HDB, which is like an actual production database uh, where Cython is essentially everywhere, right? So you have this database management system where there's some networking server or written in async IO, all of this HDB server thing is in, in, in fact Python. Um, there's a query compiler, like HDB has its own expressive query language called HQL that then gets um, transpiled to SQL, and you know, like with uh, all of those things that it does, finally it communicates with Postgres, which is the data store of HDB. So you know, kind of instead of re-implementing, uh, you know, uh, write-ahead logs and actual block storage and so on and so on, like HDB just builds on a database that we already know is kind of bulletproof and it sees super wide adoption in the industry. Um, so. Where's Cython in this picture? Where you have a client app, user code uses the HDB client, you know, we, we connect to the network server. Well, it's, it's essentially everywhere, right? Like it's uh, in your client when you're calling it, it's in the server code that um, parses the protocol that the client speaks. Uh, it's in the query compiler that makes it faster. Uh, and it's finally in the Postgres interaction, which for example led um, the, 
HDB developers to release async PG, a client for Postgres that is the most performant client that we have at this point. Um, well, like to be perfectly honest with you, to be perfectly open with you, because you can check this, uh, this is an open source project. Uh, well, none of those things are cited on anymore. Um, the query compiler was rewritten in Rust so that, you know, the CLI, which is uh, for, for SGB, which is also in Rust, can just reuse the same code and whatnot. And it just turned out to be uh, even more performant than Cython. So, like, this is one example where maybe all those um, arrows will be green at some point. But they aren't, they aren't yet. Now, there's a lot of Cython involved. Uh, so again, like what does Cython do? Well, Cython takes a PYX file, which is, uh, you can think of it as a Python file, but with additional syntax. So it's a superset of the Python programming language. It takes that thing, transpiles it to C, which generates like a huge C file. Like it's very easy for you to uh, take like a, 50 line or 100 line a PYX file and generate two megs of, of C with that. Um, it co you can compile it then as a C extension and import it you know, as a regular module. Obviously, it's not really a regular module anymore. Now it's an extension module, so there are a little, um, you know, so there are differences now, like if you're debugging or whatever. Um, but we hope that through this process, you can make things much faster. So in, in HDB's case, like, you know, as I said, like, this is pretty much like everywhere. If we look at the code base there, you just, you know, like, s see the tree there. There's, you know, some CLI things. There's uh, some common libraries. Oh, there's this HQL parse already rewritten in Rust. Um, but there's, oh, now GraphQL, uh, the, which does have an extension compiled. The green one is an SO. Uh, the PYX file is what was the source originally, and the C is what uh, Cython transpiled the PYX into. Oh, I can actually see there's also a GraphQL rewrite in the, in the works. So uh, there's going to be another green, uh, green arrow. But so far, it's Cython. So you know, let, let's focus on that for now uh, in this talk. Yeah, so like the protocol, again, implemented in a PYX, P P PXD is like, you know, a library. It's not this module that you can import. It's, it's like an internal library of uh, Cython that only Cython can access, like you cannot import those. So PYX files, PXD files, transpile into C that you can then compile into SO. In my case, it's Python 3.10 on uh, Darwin, so macOS. And so on and so on. Like there's there, uh, there's Cython everywhere. I can just keep keep just scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. Uh, finally, getting to PG Proto, which is a project in HDB that is reused across like ten repositories or whatever. Like where everything that actually talks to uh, Postgres is implemented in Cython because it is the fastest way to do this. Um, and through this, this lowest layer of interaction with Postgres is the same performance regard regardless whether it's your HDB uh, client or it's your HDB server or it's async PG where you don't care about HDB at all and so on and so on. So plenty of usage here um, of PG Proto, like which some of those files are pretty small. Like so I kind of, you know, if, if you want to like, I, I recommend just clicking through this. Um, but what I also wanted to show you is um, like those things actually kind of get compiled into um, many modules, some of which uh, are only imp uh, imported at a particular moment in HDB's lifecycle, meaning this also kind of um, makes import time better. But I kind of looked at all of those PIX files in HDB and I'm like, like which one is the nicest one to show you, you know, to introduce you to, to Cython? And, and none of them were really easy because like, as you can see, like there's so many of them, there's like so many interactions or like production ones. So I used that tall one instead uh, that I, I wrote a bunch of time ago um, that does this. Like, let me show you just one example. If you have a mixer, right? Like an audio mixer, you have inputs and you can, well, later get like some output like that is stereophonic, right? So the monophonic input in one and in two and in three, essentially get mixed into a signal that is left and right. And all of those three can be panned. So you can select whether they should go in the center or they should go into the left speaker or the right speaker, right? Uh, so we're going to be looking at 
actual code that does this panning in Cython. So prepare for it, it's ugly. <laughs> so calculate panning. It's not a def, it's a CP def. And it has four arguments, and they're not type annotated, they're annotated by types of uh, Cython. So pan is double, there's an array of mono signals, there's an output array of stereo signals, and uh, there's a number of frames that we actually want to process. Um, the actual processing is this for loop uh, in uh, line 36 to 38, but before we get there, we actually have to extract the um, low-level C array from the Python object um, using data.sshorts, uh, since we're using 16-bit uh, calculations. And then even though we do some calculations, we need to cast. Like if you see line 37 and line 38, there are, there are two int 16t casts. Those are like C, C level casts. This is perfectly ugly, um, but this is something that through evolution, through kind of looking at what Cython is generating, allowed me to generate the least um, slow version of panning calculation. If you only did what Python is doing, so just created those th three last lines and removed all this panning and just did with the arrays as they are, things would still work but there would be a lot of the indirection we talked about before where um, Python would need to check, like, oh, is the index that you're giving even a number? Oh, is that index, in fact, in that array? Um, maybe indexing in that array is overloaded, so we're using, you know, this kind of get adder or whatever, like, and so on and so on. So uh, Python would do a lot of interaction through doing this ugliness where we define some int32 type of i, meaning we know what the range is returning. We will be only having integer 32 uh, numbers. Instructing Cython allows it to shed all the safety checks and just do the equivalent that we would otherwise have in, um, in Python, uh, in C. Yeah, so how does this look like on the C side? So when we already Cythonize our PYX file, uh, what do we get? Well, we get tons of code, but it's tons of code because it's very, very well documented. For example, uh, on line 3000 almost, right? Like we have this um, kind of comment that says, this is the line that I'm transcribing now. And there's a bunch of lines before that, that, that is just this particular line. Um, so Cython is generating a ton of dunder dunder PYX names. It has to do this dunder dunder PYX because the namespace in C is flat, right? So maybe there's gonna be another module, uh, like another C library that you wanna use. So to make sure that we're not clashing with any C libraries, we have to do those ugly names. But doesn't matter. Like we, you, we can actually kind of look past this and just ignore the dunder dunder pyx and see, oh, there's calculate panning, uh, there's some self, there's some args, there's some keyword arguments. Okay, I can kind of recognize what it's trying to do. But this is just this um, line at the very top. It's kind of boring. So what's, what's going to happen next? Oh, next we're actually now defining those uh, C def shorts. Uh, taking as shorts from actual Python arrays. Uh, so yeah, literally this um, kind of uh, struct access that we're doing, the very, very simple operation that the compiler, C compiler can now like smartly just inline whenever it, uh, whenever it needs to. So all of that is very cheap and Cython is now showing us like, oh, this is the line that I translated, this is another line I translated. And uh, finally we get to the for loop thanks to us saying that the i is an int 32t uh it'll just reuse this um like variable from from uh, the top and generate a regular c for loop which is pretty efficient that's pretty amazing actually right like in our code in pyx we wrote for i in range one frames and what it actually generated was an efficient c loop like that's that's kind of that's kind of impressive and finally when we get to what we wanted to have which is all oh, those uh actual panning operations, we see that they directly translate to what I wrote above. Like, they're literally the same thing, only with more parentheses, because parentheses are cool. Uh, so we have two lines of this, and finally we just return the value, right? Um, so returning the value function exit code, um, like, it's very simple here, like, there's nothing else we need to do. 
and oh, obviously we have this like uh, reference uh, counting code that is automatically done for us. Um, and that's it, right? So yeah, like if you use Cython to make things faster, you'll often have to look at this resulting C code because it will not be faster and you'll be like, why? And you'll look at the C code and you'll see some, uh, well, unnecessary checks that Cython is doing to ensure that your uh, numbers are really numbers and you don't put, put none uh, where none shouldn't go and there's no exception and so on and so on. So you really need to do all those ugly changes such that it generates efficient code. This code doesn't look very nice. It's not meant to be really human readable all the time. It's not meant to be reviewed on GitHub. Like, so it doesn't really matter that the names are kind of verbose or whatever. The C compiler doesn't care about the names. It'll be able to really um, optimize this pretty well. And yeah, like I was able to make my pure Python code 20 times faster in the synthesizer when I moved it to Cython. So pretty cool there. Uh, one thing that I hated about using Cython though, is that now if I kept using MyPy, so if I kept using static typing, I had to move all my actual Python types into a stub file, into a PYI file, because now like PYX was no longer visible to the type checker. Ty the type checker didn't know uh, what PYX files meant. So this is sort of annoying because now you have two files that you need to keep in sync. Not particularly, um, um, you know, kind of great for usability. So yeah, like Cython, an improvement overriding C code um, itself, but not exactly a perfect situation. And in fact, like in Python, we have an even worse situation where uh, if we want to make things faster, we often rewrite things that were perfectly good Python before, uh, so they were really readable, easy to review, uh, easy to maintain, into less maintainable and less easy to review C code just for performance's sake. So here, like in Python 3.7, what's new, you can see that ABC methods and functions were rewritten in C for performance, and it gave performance, uh, you know, kind of a, a boost that, you know, is one point time X faster. Okay, cool. Like, same with order dict in 3.5 was re-implemented in C, like up to 100 times faster. That's also cool, but, you know, kind of, Annoying that now it's no longer so readable as it was before, and uh, now the only uh, implementation of Python that um, works with the Python implementation that is still there is PyPy, because Python is using this one. So we have code duplication, and there's less, you know, kind of, uh, less ease of main maintenance later on. And you have to understand, like Python is a million lines of code, half of which is C. So it's a huge system where it's not possible for a single person to understand everything that's going on. And if we are moving bits of it to C, that's moving in the wrong direction. It's not making things easier for, for people to maintain in the future. Uh, like for example, like async IO was re-implemented in, uh, well, like the e event loop of async IO was re-implemented in C for 3.7 as well, like 15 times faster, cool. But I love the fact, and I was giving talks about this, that AsyncIO was a reference implementation of an asynchronous framework in Python. So it was literally very easy for us to see what is going on and very easy to debug through every step of what AsyncIO is doing. And that was true before 3.7. That was true in 3.6. In 3.7, things got, you know, moved to, um, to C, and since then we got, you know, kind of uh, more features in uh, AsyncIO that are core Python and whatnot. So it's no longer an implementation that can teach you very clearly about asynchronous programming. Now you need some help from some book or, you know, some tutorial videos or whatever else. But the worst thing about this is that, you know, um, C is not an easy language to program in, uh, also due to security, right? There's plenty of things where uh, you have CVEs uh, thrown uh, around, like where OpenSSL does this wrong or that wrong, or another library is open to, you know, kind of remote code execution or whatever. Uh, you need to update your iPhone like today because something happened. And most of those issues stem from memory unsafety. So, 
dealing with C kind of kind of annoying. Like it was an awesome language uh, when it was first created, and the fact that Python is written in C is a big part of why it was successful, and that continues to be the case. But writing C today seems to me like by hand seems to me like it's it's not something that we should be doing. Like it's 2022. Like we have the technology. We we can do better. So maybe we can kind of do something like Cython, but that is using type annotations that you already have in your Python code. And you know, we can read the Python code just as Cython is reading PYX files, and now we can generate better things that are faster things. Well, so like you should you should feign surprise when I say that it's possible because for now, like, you know, we're we're still in this wandering mode, whether it's possible or it isn't. And if you read PEP484, where um, type hints were defined, um, it says, using type hints for performance optimization is left as an exercise for the reader. Uh, yeah, like, th that was a sentence I put uh, because uh, Guido said, like, tell them in the PEP that we don't want to do Python, uh, performance optimizations in, uh, with, with type hints. And I'm like, well, Maybe we will at some point. So, you know, how about we just do this kind of, you know, like a, a little bit of a joke so that we, we, we leave the door open for the future. Um, but there were very important reasons why we didn't want to give people the hope at the time of type hints creation that they will make things faster. Well, like, first of all, this is a tremendously big task to actually make use of uh, type hints in a way that uh, optimizes things away. Moreover, as I told you, dynamicism in, in Python is so so deeply ingrained that you know, like that would essentially mean changing the semantics of the language. And you know, it's somewhere else here in the same pep, we say like, yeah, we're not going to be changing the semantics of the language. It's going to still be the same Python as you know. Uh, so it was important for us not to um, not to well promise something that we were not ready to deliver. But more importantly. Types are not created alike. Um, in a talk I gave at uh, PyCon US this year, it's already on YouTube, I can see. Uh, so yeah, you should also watch it. On, uh, what I say is that you should be flexible in what you accept, so the arguments to your function, and strict in what you emit, so the returns of your function. What that means is that if you have um, a function that accepts a list of string, well, maybe it could accept an iterable string. So like, you know, you could put a tuple of strings or uh, some generator that generates strings or whatever. Uh, this is a tricky example, by the way, but you know, let's, let, let, let's go with it. Um, but all of those examples of types that we see here, so an abstract iterable of string, or an int or a string or a none, right? Uh, or a tuple of ints, so either a single int or many ints in a tuple, all of those suck for optimization. Because if you have an iterable, which can be anything that you can iterate over, like what can you express about it in C? Nothing, because you still have to use the iteration protocol in Python using the Python C API to be able to iterate over it, because you cannot make any guarantees whether this is actually a list or an array that you can now get shorts of or whatever else. Like You, you, you know nothing. Um, so this is not something you can really optimize. Or if you have a, a union of like, oh, this is either an int or a string. How can you allocate memory for it now? Well, you can't. So this is not something that will be very well optimized later on, even if you had an optimizer. Or if you have a tuple that has like, you know, variable size. Again, not something that is very easy to just put somewhere on the stack or even allocate efficiently on a heap. So types that you will be using all the time in your Python programs don't seem like they are very much the same as the types that Cython used before. We looked at the, an example of a Cython code, and the types that were there were really like int32t, which means like a signed integer of 32 bits, or double, which means, yeah, it's a float, but it's exactly double, um, or in 16, or whatever else. Like So very concrete types that the C compiler can know. None of those are concrete. Even integer is a magic type in Python because it can be either small or very big and it will scale automatically for you. So all of those things make it kind of not very easy to use type annotations for um, optimizing Python code. But 
this didn't stop people from doing it, and it worked anyway. Cool. Uh, MyPyC was released three years back uh, by the MyPy team. It's uh, now still hosted uh, as part of the MyPy uh, code in, uh, in the same repository. It was briefly somewhere else, but it was moved back because simply the relation between the type checker and the code that is later generated is too big uh, to split the two projects. So what MyPy uh, said is like, hey, uh, we were able to make the type checker four times faster by compiling it uh, to C using MyPy C, which is using type annotations. So that's pretty amazing. Let's see why this is uh, the case, like why this is possible, and maybe other projects are also using this. Uh, so let's see if they are faster as well. So my PyC is something that like I I would like everybody to at least test in their code because it is the the simplest thing that you can do that still will uh, result in faster code for you. So it's easy to get started because it is Python, right? Like you can read Python, you can execute the Python that you have, and it'll compile. If it will fail to compile, well, fine. Like you know, you'll you'll still be able to run your pure Python code. It'll still look fine. It will still be uh, good. You have expressive types, so the types that I showed you before, like you know, you have iterables, you have generics, you have like a bunch of those things that you're using in static typing uh, without having to deal with int 32 t's and doubles and you know, um, getting out shorts from an array uh, and whatnot and whatnot. Like those are just regular Python types that you would use otherwise for uh, type checking purposes. Um, you have the entire Python ecosystem. So another thing I didn't tell you about Cython is that if you add this X to your um, file extension, now you're losing all linters. You're, you're losing auto formatting. You're losing, you know, ability to just uh, visually debug and a bunch of other things because most of the Python tooling in the ecosystem doesn't understand Cython very well. Even syntax highlighting for Cython is a different thing than, than regular Python since it's a superset. Uh, so it does have some ugly edge cases where it doesn't uh, format the, uh, well, highlight things perfectly. So yeah, like with MyPyC, you write regular Python code, which is perfect because you already know all the linters, you already have a favorite text editor, and you know, you're already using talks and whatever else. So you can still be, be using all of those things perfectly fine. Um, it actually increases startup time because of uh, removing a bunch of uh, decisions that regularly happen at import time and doing them at compile time. So like, if you care about uh, startup performance, this also is an advantage for you. And finally, like you have like um, a migration path for existing code. So in Cython, yeah, like what what I did with the synthesizer first was write code in Python, and then I actually had to copy paste it into PyX and make it increasingly less Pythonic. Um, so that also works, but. At some point, when I started writing more code for the synthesizer, I was already in Cython world. So I was already writing Cython code, or sometimes re really just C code. Um, so you're kind of losing this connection to Python. Like if you already have a big um, project, like MyPyC is easier for you to adopt because you can just simply um, compile existing Python uh, modules. And compilation is optional, as I said. So if there are any issues, like if you cannot compile something because you're using a feature of Python that like MyPyC doesn't support, or uh, simply in your particular compiler or operating system, stuff doesn't really work yet, it's off a software, um, it's still fine. You can just keep using Python for now and just report a bug and maybe it'll fix it and things will get better in time. Oh, and, and obviously, not only do you have still static type safety uh, through type checking, but you have now runtime uh, type safety because MyPyC actually does check um, whether the types are the ones that you um, told it, it will, uh, they will be. So yeah, like 
if we compare my by C versus Cython directly, what we'll see is that um, you don't need non-standard syntax, which is great. Um, like those CP devs and whatever, like I, I still, you know, even though I, I wrote a bunch of Cython code, I still don't love those. Um, yeah, so like it's just clean, normal type annotated code um, with first class static typing support. So like all those weird things like unions, like, you know, generics, like uh, type uh, vars, like th this sort of thing. That's supported. You just you can just use like full fledged typing. Just go wild. It's fine, um, and it has powerful type inference. So if you've seen the example of the synthesizer of the panning, I had to literally tell Cython like, I this index in my for loop is an int 32t. I had to do it because otherwise it would just assume well I don't know what it is. So it would just do a pi object and it would be super slow. Uh, so in MyPy, um, we do type inference so that a lot of uh, the times, like only by uh, just passing a variable to a function call or assigning it to a name, is enough for that name ha to have a type. You don't have to say, like, you know, a uh, colon str equals string, because if you just say a equals some string, we already know it's a string, right? So this type of inference means that you will see increased performance even if you don't put like magic annotations all over the place. Um, and yeah, like due to strict enforcement of types at runtime, like you'll actually have like easier time to debug things. Like in Cython, uh, if you uh, remove all those special checks saying this is always an in 32 and then you pass it anon, what will happen is a sec fault. Like you'll just crash your entire Python interpreter and then good luck, just go and debug. Uh, in my PyC, there are uh, checks for the types all the time, and they will raise a Python level type error, a type level, uh, a Python level exception. So you'll be able to see where you're making the mistake, which is much better um, for kind of usability as a programmer. So yeah, like why is this even fast? We, we just said that the types uh, used for type annotations are not the same as the ones that are used in Cython. Uh, plus, in Cython, you really need to heavily annotate everything uh, so that it's any faster. So like, how does MyPy do it? Well, um, first of all, it, it does the same thing as Cython. So in Python, when you have a Python module, it's called like something .py, what happens when you uh, run this file is Python takes it and then compiles it into PYC. And what PYC is, is a totally different language, is bytecode that um, talks to a stack-based um, interpreter. And that stack-based interpreter has a bunch of opcodes that in a very, very tight loop in C, E, C, C, in, in Python source code, is executing your entire program. So in fact, like when you're running Python, all you have is a loop uh, checking for the next opcode, for the next opcode, for the next opcode from your program. So any action that uh, is done is done in this very tight loop. And at the end, each opcode has some implementation. So it'll call some C API function, like doing, I don't know, uh, allocating a new dictionary or checking uh, whether a key is in a dictionary or whatever, right? Like a bunch of things will happen, but that's in direction, right? Th there is this tight loop that checks all the opcodes. By rewriting your code so that it already writes the C API calls directly, we remove the uh, interpreter loop overhead, right? That's already a, a bunch of percent uh, in performance improvement. But that would be not enough. So it type checks, as I said, which generates nice exceptions, but only at boundaries with static typing. So if there is a mm, area of your program that is fully type checked, fully type annotated, um, then we don't need to have any type checks inside it, right? Like we only need to type checks at boundaries. And better yet, like then we can remove some bounce checks and other types of checks that are otherwise um, necessary and hurt performance. So for example, for ints and booleans, we unbox them entirely, meaning they're no longer Py objects, they're no longer Python objects on the heap. They're value types on the stack. Like sometimes they have to be still on the heap if they're like huge ints, but like that's sort of unlikely for many cases. So ints and booleans are much faster in MyPyC. And if you uh, declare attributes as final, or if you specify functions and classes, they're just 
um, treated as immutable, meaning, again, they can just be put in a different uh, place in uh, memory, and they can be loaded at import time, like, you know, simply by copying memory from one place to another without actually having to uh, initialize much. So that makes stuff much faster. But that already kind of um, shows us that maybe this is not exactly compatible with Python, so let's see, let's see what's going to happen next. Um, yeah, like, and name references are resolved at compile time, meaning this example I gave before about daytime.date.today, that would be already resolved inside the C code. So you don't have to ask about, you know, oh, get added from locals, from globals, or whatever. That would be already pre-resolved, making it much faster. So all we great if that just allowed you to just you know, run MyPC over any existing code and it all would work, but there are obviously some limitations of this approach where you compile things. So first of all, um, classes only support single inheritance with traits, like you'll see. Um, classes are native classes, meaning they're the same as any other C extension class. Uh, they're pretty much like, Almost the same, but not exactly. Like you'll see uh, differences when uh, you're trying to access their dicts and whatever. Like you know, they they don't behave exactly the same as uh, Python level classes. They're not um, they're not so dynamic. So most meta classes are not supported. Uh, most class decorators are not supported uh, unless actually they have um, support in MyPyC built in. Uh, attributes are slotted every time, all the time. So the shape of the type, meaning what kind of attributes are on an object, this is predefined at static time, all right? So um, if you have a bunch of attributes in an object, the set of the ones that you have in Dunder in it or in your data class or, or any other like way where we know what they should be at initialization time, this is the attributes that you're gonna get. If you're trying to create a new attribute l later on in the life of an object, it'll yell at you that like this object doesn't have this attribute because um, those are put in memory in a very, very uh, tight manner. So you cannot just simply keep adding on those. And that's because there's just no dict, all right? Like all of them are tightly packed in memory. So yeah, uh, you also don't have operator overloading, which is less of an issue. Like, but you know, some 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 cute APIs sometimes like to uh, overload operators, so that would no longer be possible. Uh, you cannot also make custom descriptors, but that's that's uh, also less of an issue for practical code. Yeah, so let's see how this actually worked in practice when we added uh, MyPyC support to Black, because Black is now compiled with MyPyC. It's twice as much, uh, tw twice as fast due to this. So let's see how hard it was. It was hard. Um, um, Michael Sullivan, who is the original contributor of this support, did this in October 2019, and we finally shipped this in November 2021, because MyPyC had to become a little more uh, mature, and we also were not uh, excited about losing uh, Windows support and, and, and a bunch of other things. So we, we need to wait until all of this was actually uh, perfectly usable. But finally, um, Richard C., our contributor, um, I finished the support for uh, MyPyC in November 2021, and we shipped it. So we needed to make changes. Uh, so Michael made mo most of this like back in 2019 where everything, really everything had to be typed. Um, you couldn't have like any uh, much like in your code because otherwise that would just fall out of the uh, compiled um, space of uh, MyPyC, meaning that would just not be very helpful for anything. So we had to type everything. We ship like a fork of lib223 from uh, CPython standard library. We had to type all that. Uh, and the types actually had to type check correctly because if they were not true, it wasn't just a type checker annoyance, it was literally a sec fold then. So they had to really be true. And I had to remove adders and replace them with di data classes because data classes are a class decorator which has specific support only in uh, MyPyC, so adders is not supported. And some code restructuring was necessary, but very little. I'll actually show you examples. So for example, like I talked about like whether attributes that are final are now faster because they're immutable, so they're just pre-rendered like, you know, in, in a different space in memory. So we had to put the finals all in everywhere. Uh, we had to fix some types that were not really uh, well specified before. Uh, even if MyPy didn't really, mm, you know, um, tell us, like we really had to make sure that this is true. 
Um, and finally, yes, like blip 223 had to now get all types, which it doesn't in CPython, so we had to type that part. Um, yeah, and, and create a bunch of like restructures. So for example, the symbols now uh, is a subclass that actually types all attributes so that we know what they are. Um, and so on and so on. So in, in setup py, we also have like this specific part now that actually allows us to run mypyc the compiler if you want to. So like if you're interested in like how you even run the mypyc compiler, we, you just run mypyc over your code. But like if you want to use it in setup py, like black is a good example of like how we do this. Uh, so, for example, we had to remove data classes sometimes because they didn't actually agree with uh, generics in Python, uh, in my PC. So, you know, kind of, there were a, a bunch of changes where we actually had to move a bunch of uh, things around. For example, we had to change the order of those classes here. Uh, well, but wait, I said that it only supports single inheritance. Well, not exactly true. Like, you can have traits in my PC, which are like, you know, kind of mix-ins. Uh, and if you just kind of adhere to a bunch of rules that are specified in the MyPyC documentation, you can actually now run uh, your uh, multiple inheritance with some limitations. But the results were pretty cool. Like, you know, we actually are running twice as fast as we were before. Uh, we are even uh, importing faster, but like the actual formatting is like literally twice as fast. So that made our users pretty happy. That made us really happy. Uh, so those are actual production uh, results now from um, pre-existing project that existed you know, very, very happily without MyPyC before, and now exists very happily with MyPyC. And MyPyC, you know, kind of, looks very similar to Cython, but it's such an improvement on it because I don't really think we would ever agree to rewrite all of MyPy, uh, all of Black in Cython, so just to rename all py files into pyx. But with MyPyC, we were able to just keep Python and still ship a much faster uh, all the formatter. The nice part about it is that even if you have some weird, weird platform where uh, we don't ship wheels for it, binary wheels, it's still fine you can still just use the Python version, which we still ship on PyPI, so everybody's happy. We have wide support, but for the most popular platforms, it's much faster than it was. So I don't really have time for this anymore, uh, so very quickly, like, hey, what about JITs? You know, like, is, isn't that like a still better way? Instead of doing ahead of time compilation, you know, you should be using uh, just-in-time compilation. So obviously, PyPy is saying, yes, we are doing this, and they're very compatible, and you know, like, they, they, they've been around for like 20 years now. Uh, and they say that on average, they're four point times, uh, four, four point five times faster than CPython. If you saw what MyPy said about themselves being compiled with MyPyC, they said they're four times faster. Um, Black was twice as fast with MyPyC. So that's kind of in the ballpark already uh, with, uh, with PyPy, where PyPy has issues with um, C API compatibility, and there's always some library that is not exactly compatible, so it's, it's, it's a struggle to actually um, support it. But also, like, it, it is a third-party project. So what they do is they have to actually re-implement everything that CPython adds to a new version of Python, J just in their interpreter. So now they're still uh, supporting Python 2.7, they no longer support 3.7, they support 3.8, which is now their main supported version, whereas now 3.10 is uh, the main supported version in CPython, but they didn't finish 3.10 yet. Like the 3.10 support still really needs work. Uh, 3.9 is only in beta. So like you're always kind of behind with PyPy. Like it's, it's understandable because this is a third party project and that's just the nature of things. But it's to an ex a certain extent annoying. Uh, and like the 2.7 two support is weird, right? Like why do they still support it? Because PyPy itself is written in Python and it's written in Python too. And it's so such a big project that it's going to be a big effort to rewrite it in Python 3. So they're going to have to support Python 2 forever. Um, here's me uh, on a sprint with PyPy people. They're very nice people. A uh, third person on the left, uh, called Frigidi Bolts, now is actually paid to work on PyPy. Uh, has a permanent university position in Dusseldorf. So like, cool. Like we're going to see more progress on PyPy. I hope. But yeah, like. Maybe, maybe not exactly something that can save everybody uh, as, as a Python user. But PyPy is, is great because it, it shipped many things to the general Python community that all of you are using. Like PyTest started as a part of PyPy. Um, CFFI started as 
part of PyPy because they wanted a C types that isn't very slow on PyPy. Um, and HPy now, a better C API for Python, is also um, you know, kind of spearheaded by uh, the PyPy folk. So they have very m good contributions to the general um, Python ecosystem. So I, I love them for that. Could C Python have a JIT? Just, just to uh, pull man's JIT where it sees whether your data isn't changing and is changing opcodes in the interpreter loop to more specialized ones. And there's plenty of them already implemented. And that already kind of uh, gives us hope for a faster Python. Um, and you know, kind of they're like, ah, maybe in 3.13 we'll be able to kind of add a more full-fledged JIT to CPython, which I think, well, maybe that's a little optimistic. Maybe 3.14 will be more realistic. And that's kind of hi-fi, right? Yeah. <laughs> that, 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 yeah. OK, but e even today, you can use Pigeon which is a uh, pip installable uh, JIT based on .NET. So you can try it out. Maybe it's already faster for you. Uh, and like, just I, I just wanted to close this. Like, when I agreed to do this topic on like, my PC, let's talk about it. Like, just like a day after or whatever, uh, Glyph published this blog post about exactly the same thing. So some of the topic is the same with his. Like, I read it because I'm interested. Um, but yeah, like, it's, it's a topic on our minds uh, right now, and clearly. So yeah, uh, thanks for staying five minutes later than, than, than we were supposed to. Uh, my name is Wukash. I'm going to be here for uh, the remainder of the break right now. Uh, thanks for your attention. <laughs>